in Revelation chapter 17 today. We read about the fall of Babylon in chapters 14 and 16. In chapters 17 and 18, we're going to read the details of the fall of Babylon. Only Jerusalem is mentioned more in Scripture than the city of Babylon. Babylon is mentioned 287 times in Scripture. Remember, Babylon started with Babel. And that's when Nimrod built the tower. He wanted to reach the gods. And so God said, no, we're going to change things up. And he changed the language which divided the people. And, uh, but Babel became Babylon. And it's the same city that has existed uh, all of those years. And uh, Babylon is actually a literal city. It's on the Euphrates River. It's not occupied right now uh, because um, Saddam Hussein couldn't get it rebuilt. He tried. He started building the bricks and making the bricks, but he had other ambitions that got in the way. And uh, so he never got to complete the project. And Babylon still sits pretty empty um, there on the Euphrates River. It always represented evil. Babylon was never a good city. It was never somewhere that you wanted to go vacation. Uh, well, then again, there's Las Vegas. Anyway, um, in our study today, Babylon takes on the image of a woman who is a harlot. The term harlot, it's uh, pornea, and it's where we get our term pornography from. And so we understand it and recognize it to be a sinful uh, type of word and a, 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 simple rep a sinful representation of who this woman is. Idol worship is often described as harlotry in scripture and people find false gods to worship and honor and instead of worshiping the one true god they worship these false idols and we see our kind of idol worship uh, taking place here in the united states and well actually through the whole world by these stars that rise up and we give them a place of authority and we give them this this limelight that everyone respects them um, for the things that they have achieved and they worship them for and, and they don't even realize they're doing it they're just doing it. it it the same kind of honor and worship that we should be giving to god they give to human beings that have achieved these goals. And sometimes it's a, a music star. Uh, we've seen many that are out there. Some of them have halfway decent music. It doesn't matter what their music is like. A lot of the music is very evil, actually. Uh, but when you look at how people are worshiping these figures, it's very sad. Uh, that kind of worship uh, should be reserved for the worship of God. Instead, it's being directed at people. Uh, we see the same, same things with sports figures, with CEOs, with actors, with politicians. And the media focuses on these people and elevates them to a place that um, no man should actually ever be elevated to. So, we're seeing all of this take place in our world today. And as we read Revelation chapter 17, we can see how the people that are alive during that time will buy into this, will be absorbed by the things that are taking place. Because without God, you don't have any other answers. If you aren't trusting and believing in the one true God, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have to have something to fill that void. And that's what 
this system is. It's actually a religious system, this Babylon, this harlot that is rising up. And it's a religious system that covers the whole earth. Um, it fills that void that Christianity leaves behind when the rapture takes place. There's going to be a void of the truth and a, a void of hope. And so people have to find something else to place their hope in. We're seeing that today where people are placing their hope in things like um, sports or religion. People place their hope in, um, in, in different religious systems that offer no hope, but they're fully on board with it because they feel good about themselves. And sometimes we do things where we feel good about ourselves for doing them, for helping someone and, and blessing someone. And, and while that's okay, that shouldn't be the object of the reason why we do it. Uh, that shouldn't be the reason we help someone or donate or whatever the case may be. Uh, the reason should be we want to do what God wants us to do. And then we get blessed because we do because we're faithful in doing what God would have us to do. Today's message is titled, Idol Worship Thrives. As we continue our study through the book of Revelation in chapter 17, we're going to pick it up in verse 1, where we read, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. An angel, one of the angels that were responsible for pouring out the seven bowls of judgment, one of the... John is probably like, wow, he's coming to talk to me. And now here he is talking to John, sharing this information with John about what he's going to see. This judgment of a religious system. We're told in verse 1 that the great harlot sits on many waters. Uh, that's not talking about it's an ocean-bearing uh, you know, uh, type of harlot, it's saying that it's worldwide. This harlot is everywhere, sitting on many waters, and it covers the whole earth. It's not just a local religion. While many people make assumptions of who this religious system is, I don't believe we can be sure or even know that it is a religious system that exists today. It may be one that is created once the rapture takes place, then to fill the void. It may come from existing systems that are out there. And a lot of people say this is Catholicism because we're going to be talking about sitting on the mountains of Rome, seven mountains, and this must be Catholicism. And, and I know people say that, but I, I don't see it in Scripture, and I'll... Uh, uh, no, I won't tell you why. I don't see it that way. I, I don't want to get into why things aren't the way they are. I'm going to get into what I do see reading the word. And so I believe there's, uh, have you ever heard of Chrislam? This is a combination of Christianity and Islam. And there are people now buying into this idea that Christianity and Islam can exist together, coexist. We're worshiping the same God anyway, right? No. The God of Islam is not the God of the Bible, as much as they would like us to believe it is. They wor or worship, actually, the sun god. Allah is actually the sun god. It, it's not the, the god of all creation. And, and if you talk 
to people that worship in Islam that are Muslim that worship. They don't even know if they're saved. They don't know if they're ever going to make it to heaven. They hope they do, but they don't know. That's the difference between Christianity and Islam. We know because our God has told us in his word. We can know that we have a relationship with him. We can know what our future holds. Most other religions don't. And their religious leaders, I know where they are. They're in the ground. They've died. They've been buried. They're in graves. So uh, there isn't much validity. There isn't much support for the future of those religions. But they're going to come together because they need to find some way to counter Christianity. Once the rapture happens, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to hear or remember what you told them. You see, you're sharing with them the good news of Jesus Christ. You're sharing with them that the rapture is going to happen. It's an event that the Bible tells us is going to take place. And we believe it could be soon. And so when that event takes place, they're going to remember, oh yeah, I was told about this. There's a basket back on the table that has USB drives in it. And you can pick up that USB drive, give it to a loved one that doesn't know Jesus, and you can tell them, this USB drive has some information on it that will tell you about what is going to happen in the future. And take it, look at it, you know, keep it, keep it. Because when the rapture happens, that'll be the first place they go. I don't believe the websites are going to be up anymore after that, the ones that actually tell us the truth. And so they're not going to have access to the truth. And so anyone that wants to grab USBs, grab them, take a few with you, and then give them to your loved ones that, or to a friend at work to whoever you would want to hear the word. It presents a message that tells about the events taking place today. It has documents that explain what the Bible says about the things going on in the world and the upcoming rapture. And then it has a video of, of salvation that they can hear about how to be led you know, to the Lord in a prayer of salvation and begin a relationship. Then it also has a document on there of what to do next. And so I recommend we have the drives back there on the table. They're in the basket back there. They also have a QR code on the outside. If they are afraid to put a USB drive, they can scan the QR code. It brings them right to the website and that has all the same information, but at least now they can look at it for themselves. This isn't a promotional video for Calvary Chapel. This is a promotional video for Jesus Christ. And it, we don't put our name on it, and, and we, we aren't trying to sell anything. We're just trying to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. So that's what they're going to need to hear at this point. Once the rapture happens, those people are going to look for answers. And if they don't have something to give them those answers, uh, they're going to be misled. They're going to be redirected towards lies instead of the truth. We're told that people will believe the lie rather than the truth. And the enemy is going to have plenty of lies to deceive everyone with. You can't get to heaven based on the religious system that you belong to. Not even Calvary Chapel. It, it, you know, I go to a Calvary Chapel. That means nothing. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's having the Holy Spirit inside. That's what gets people to heaven. Without Jesus Christ, without the Holy Spirit, 
we're stuck here on earth. And that's what's happening in the world right now. There's plenty of good churches preaching the gospel, sharing the good news, but there are plenty that aren't. There are plenty that are making stuff up. Progressive Christianity is nothing of the sort. It's, there's nothing Christian about progressive Christianity. It leads people in the wrong direction. It gives people hope for things that are on the earth instead of what God has planned for the future. And uh, they're misguided. They're being led the wrong way. We're told in verse 2, the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with the false powers of the enemy. When people are drunk, they tend to do things that they wouldn't normally do when they're sober. And so the things that people are doing and experiencing during this time, uh, they're just foolishly stumbling over themselves to find some answers that will make them feel better. That's why there are so many scriptures that tell us, be sober. Because if you're not sober, you get caught up in, you know, I used to drink. And I wasn't a heavy drinker, but I made a lot of mistakes when I did drink. I was stupid when I drank alcohol. And I, I look back and I think, God preserved me for today because I shouldn't have made it to where I am today because of the stupid things that I have done in the past. And I'm grateful that he had mercy on me uh, to get me to where I am today. The rulers and uh, leaders, the, the kings that are mentioned here, of the earth are fully committed to the evil system. They bought in. This is what they're going to support. It shouldn't be too hard to believe that this is going to happen when you look at what's going on in the world today. How many people have bought into stupidity, to ignorance? I mean, it, it, it's mind-blowing when you look. Why don't people see it like we do? Why don't people see um, the, the things that are going on in our schools with the children you know, allowing children to choose their gender in elementary school. Why don't people see that this is lunacy? Why? I, I, I know. I know why. Because we have the truth. And we can discern the truth from foolishness because of Jesus Christ, because of the Holy Spirit. They don't have that. They're being molded. They, remember, they've come up through the education system. I, I hate to call it that. They come through the indoctrination system that got them to where they are today. And many of the same people I went to high school. Now, hold on. I was fully on board with them. I was fully in that camp until the Lord got a hold of my heart. You know, I was 20 years old, and I got saved, and my world changed at that point. I wasn't perfect the next day, but I was better than I was, right? I started seeing things from a different point of view. I didn't have to be taught to change my opinions. I recognized that what I thought was stupid, and it was wrong. And it was leading me in the wrong direction. I, I didn't have to be taught that. I didn't have to have someone up there telling me abortion was wrong. Immediately, I knew. And, and so my whole world changed. I started seeing things through different eyes. And that's what the world doesn't have today. They're missing out on all of this because they're still blinded by what's what they're being told. They're being fed this from the media. The angel now gives John more details in verse 3, where he says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast 
which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the harlot, uh, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. The woman is riding the same beast that was mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. The beast that had seven, horn, uh, seven heads and ten horns. And the beast is supporting the ministry. She's riding on it. The beast is holding her up. She's not in control of the beast. We know the beast to be the Antichrist. But she's not in control. She's just riding the beast. She appears to be in control. But really, the beast is just supporting her. The woman is adorned in beautiful clothing, appearing like royalty. This sounds like a halftime show, um, you know, right, at the Super Bowl. And they appear like royalty in, in all of this dress. She has a name on her forehead identifying her as a mystery. A mystery is something that isn't known. It's unknown. But it's not a mystery to us. We know. We've been told. A mystery is only a mystery to those that don't know. And so, to the world, the scripture is foolishness to those that perish. But to us, it's the power of God. And so, it's a mystery to them. It's foolishness to them. But to us, we understand there's no doubt in my mind that the scripture is accurate. How do I know? I look at the world and I say, wow, scripture told me all this was going to happen. So don't get panicked when you see the things that they're telling us on the news and stuff like that. I, you know, I could have told you that 30 years ago. I was telling it 30 years ago. I just didn't expect it to look like this. You know what I'm saying? I knew it was going to be weird. I knew it was going to be different. But I didn't expect it to, and I didn't expect to be here. Did you? I, you know, I would have expected the Lord to say, no, I'm not waiting any longer. We're, we're going to take the church out of here. But we're here for a reason. Light shining in the darkness. The dark is getting darker. The light is shining brighter. So the names tell us that she is the source of all idolatry on the earth. This is more than one religion. It's all religions that are outside of one true religion, Christianity, the religion of God, of the one true God. And when I say Christianity, I almost cringe because there are so many religions out there that claim that they're Christian. And, uh, you know, they're not. They don't have the same religious authorities. They don't have the same God, the same Son of God, the same Holy Spirit. They don't have that. Jehovah Witnesses sound like a good organization because they honor Jehovah, but they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe he's God. They believe he's the archangel Michael. Um, the Mormon religion, it's a religion that believes in some other weird stuff. I'm not going to get into what they believe because it's weird. It just doesn't make sense. And it isn't supported by the word of God. But they use this word of God and they twist it to support what they wanted to say. It's very sad. So the churches are 
First of all, the church is going to be removed. The church, the building will still be here. You won't. The church is people. And we're going to be gone. But there are going to be many false religions filling that void. Maybe it's Chrislam, that one world religion. Don't know what it's going to be. I'm not going to be going there as a member. Uh, we're going to be gone. The beast will give this system power for a specific time. I believe this will be the first half of the tribulation period. Because in the middle of the tribulation period, there's going to be the abomination of desolation that I often speak about when the Antichrist goes into the temple, he erects a statue of himself and declares himself to be God. At that point, uh, people are going to be looking to him for the answers. There's no need for this religious system at that point because he is going to be the authority and the religious system is going to evaporate. We'll get into that uh, in a minute here. Notice that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Two different groups of people. Old Testament, New Testament. The woman has been corrupt and has been um, drunk with the blood of all the believers, all those who worship the one true God from the beginning until the time of the tribulation period. Uh, the evidence that the religious system will probably accept every other religious system except true Christianity is obvious. You know, they're all happy with each other. They're okay with each other. John is marveling at what he's seeing. And then in verse 7, we read, But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So John marveled at this. He was like in awe of what he was seeing. I, I think he also was a little bit marveling about the fact that this woman was riding on the Antichrist, on the beast. And so maybe that was like, oh, who's this, you know, that has this authority that's riding the Antichrist? And the angel is now going to explain, verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. And so he's speaking of the Antichrist. This is who this character is. We've read about him in previous chapters. And he's going to ascend out of the pit. And then he's going to show himself to be the leader, the, the one um, leader that's going to be able to solve all the problems of the earth. See, we can't be here when he comes to power because we would all say, oh, that's the Antichrist. You know, oh yeah, we know, oh, yeah, we read about him. We know who he is. But we're not going to be here. But he can't be revealed until the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way. And the Holy Spirit doesn't live in churches, buildings. He lives in churches, people. And so when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, that's when this Antichrist is going to be revealed. This is the same beast from Revelation 13, 3, where he had a deadly wound and then he was healed and came back and everybody was like, oh, this is... A miracle, this is the guy. We're going to have to trust him because um, he's just doing amazing things. And all the world marveled, we're told. Then in verse 9, we read, Here is the mind which has wisdom. Seven heads of the seven mountains on which the woman sits. Seven mountains are often thought of Rome. Okay, But in the Greek, Rome, it does sit on seven hills, but not seven mountains. There's a different word 
for hills than mountains. So it would be clear that they're not talking about Rome because we're, Rome is just hills. And it wasn't that they were mountains 2,000 years ago, but now they shrunk or anything. It, this is something different. The word is clear. And the Greek word for hill was not used. It was definitely a term for mountains. Daniel chapter 2 verse 35 tells us that the rock, Jesus is the rock, stuck, struck the statue. What statue is this? This is the statue that Daniel has a vision of, of all of um, the kingdoms and the order of the kingdoms. And the rock struck the statue and it became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. The rock struck that and he became the mountain that filled the whole earth. Uh, that's his kingdom. That's the kingdom of Jesus. It's going to fill the whole earth. It's coming. And verse 10 confirms this idea as we read, There also were seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. So at that time, John was writing this, there had been five kingdoms that had fallen already. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. All of them had fallen. And Rome was now the one kingdom that was... Rome had never been conquered, by the way. Rome just kind of faded away. But Rome has never been conquered and so that is the kingdom that's really currently uh, in existence uh, as far as that's concerned. The seventh king is going to only continue for a short time. I would say about three and a half years. So that king is going to be um, this antichrist. Verse 11 tells us the final king is yet to come and he is going to be, well, he's going to be the Antichrist. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is one of the seven that go to perdition, that goes to perdition. So what he's saying is the Antichrist is one of the seven leaders and then he is going to have this um, accident where he is looks to be mortally wounded, fatally wounded, and then he comes back to life. He will become the eighth. The other seven will be gone, and he will be the eighth king um, that is going to be in charge of everything at that point. But he's going to perdition. That tells us who this actually is. Who's a, sometimes... Everybody wants to know every detail of what's going to happen so that we can have clear understanding of everything. We're not given clear understanding of everything. There's a good reason for it. We're not going to be here. And, and so it, it's not helping us to know. If we knew, we'd be focusing more on what is going to happen than being ready for the rapture. See, Jesus said, be ready for my coming because it could happen at any time. We need to be ready. That's the important milestone that we should be looking for. Not the setting up of the temple in, in Israel or you know anything ab about um, the red heifers or anything. There's a lot of distractions that we can get caught up in. Reality is the only thing that should be distracting us from the earth is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our focus should be there because when our focus is there, it changes how we live day to day. It changes how we interact with people day to day. And so, uh, you know, it's okay to live life and enjoy what we can while we're here. You know, I, I just uh, planned a 
um, a Diamondbacks game because I'm a glutton for punishment. And um, we're, we're going to go and, and see a Diamondbacks. I picked uh, a team that is doing much worse than the Diamondbacks. So hopefully we have a better chance of winning. But, you know, it, it, it's not because I, I revere the Diamondbacks. They're the most wonderful team. Anything like that. I don't put a lot of value. But I like entertainment like that. It's good, wholesome entertainment. And, and I, I enjoy a, a hot dog this big that's just <laughs> terrible for you. But it tastes really good. And so we can enjoy life. But at the same time, we can remember we can have an impact on the people that are around us. You know, I don't have to be drinking seven beers while I'm sitting there watching a game. You know, I, I can drink my lemonade and eat my hot dog and just share in, in the joy of the Lord with my wife. And, and we can have a, we have a great time when we go to the games, just people watching and stuff. And, and we have a lot of fun. Verse 12 talks about the reign of the beast and the harlot. The ten horns which you saw are the ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. They are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. That's us! And then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so that's where we get the idea that this is a worldwide religion, a worldwide organization that the harlot is sitting upon. You know, when, when we say the seven hills, how many continents are there? Seven. Seven. And so we can also look at this as a picture of the seven continents. This is a worldwide authority over the continents, um, you know, over all of the world. And that could be a, a reference uh, to what this is. But we shouldn't get hung up so much on who these people and, you know, what the plans are. The United Nations, <coughs> who... Um, really are not very united, but um, they have an agenda. It's called Agenda 2030. And many of you saw, many of you were here for um, the conference for the eight-week study that I did in Bible prophecy, and I brought this up. I gave details on Agenda 2030 uh, last year when uh, we did that. And the plan was agreed upon in September of 2015 with the United Nations agreeing to all of this. Uh, here are some of the statements in the document that's written for Agenda 2030. This is on, you can go online, you can find this for yourself. There's a list this long, I think there are 17 different points and stuff. So here are just some of the ideas that are in this document. We resolve between now and 2030 to end poverty and hunger everywhere. That's interesting. Uh, let them eat bugs. Uh, remember, we talked about that in, uh, in the, the different study that we had. We commit to providing inclusive and equitable, two words that are very popular today, quality education at all levels, early childhood, primary, secondary, tertiary, technical, and vocational training. Basically, we're indoctrinating the children. That's basically what they're saying. We commit ourselves to work tirelessly for the full implementation of this agenda by 2030. This is their plan. It, don't get panicked. It's not going to happen. There's going to be this interruption that's going to take place. But that is their plan. That's the agenda of the enemy. 
and he's got the wheels in motion. It's already being um, um, sold on the market and every news media out there. And don't think that there isn't one media that's promoting it. All of them have some sort of angle that they're bringing into this. There are many ideas in this document that may even seem wonderful, that people will be enamored with, and they're going to buy into it because they think that this is a solution. There is no solution based on human beings getting into power and making things happen. We've had 6,000 years and still haven't figured that out yet. All of a sudden, you know, there's only one person that came that could actually fix anything, and he was put to death. There's also a plan to divide the world up into 10 zones in that um, Agenda 2030. The 10 leaders that gave the power, the authority to the Antichrist. So in verse 13, we're told that these leaders are of one mind and they give a power and authority to that Antichrist. Sounds like the UN may be instrumental in actually carrying this out and making these things happen. Verse 14 tells us that these will make war with the Lamb, but he will overcome them. Is there any doubt? You know, that, that shouldn't take us by surprise. Finally, we're told that the waters that the harlot sits on are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Uh, uh, this is the religious system that covers the whole earth. Verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And when you consider that, the possibility of Babylon actually being centrally located in Jerusalem is very real. Uh, so when we look at what the, the image is of the Antichrist, he's establishing his throne in Jerusalem mid-trib. He is going to be the authority from the temple. And so this religious system could actually come out of Jerusalem. After the rapture, anything goes, right? All of the Jews are deceived. They believe that this is the Messiah. The Antichrist is their Messiah. And so he's going to allow, he's going to bring peace on the earth to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple on the same mount that the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque exist today. You can't do that if you don't bring some sort of peace, that some sort of, of agreement that everybody buys into it. And I believe that's where the one world religion then ties in together and then expands throughout the whole world. These ten kings will end up destroying this system right about the time that the Antichrist declares himself to be God. He uses one evil group to kill off another evil group. God's kind of funny that way, huh? He, he, he kind of has a sense of humor. The Antichrist no longer needs the religious system when he sets up his throne. We close today considering what we shouldn't be concerned about how to build the perfect government. We shouldn't be concerned about that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't vote. We should, because that's our responsibility. We're still supposed to look for candidates that represent the word of God the best. 
Unfortunately, I don't know of any that, you know, specifically support and represent the word. There are a few. I, I shouldn't say any. I don't know them all personally. But I know that most of them are trying also to adapt to the world. Okay, I'm okay with a transgender, you know, um, a leader in, in uh, our military who has one of the highest offices in the military and they're transgender. They're, and they're, a, psych, they're a, psychi a psychiatrist. They're, they're actually, how can you be a psychiatrist and be transgender? You're, you've lost it. You're not living in reality. How can you help someone else when you can't even help yourself? So, uh, you know, this is the world that we're living in currently today. It's very scary. The Antichrist will entice people into his government that will solve the world problems. The reality is his government is the problem. In our world today, the world during um, and in the tribulation, idol worship thrives. Anything can become an idol if we place it before God. Anything, anyone, if we place them before God. The latest idols in the media are the leaders and the parties campaigning to lead our country. They're idols. There are many people that are following them and worshiping these leaders. Now, I'm not saying that you know, we shouldn't be voting, we shouldn't be supporting, we should be supporting the one that's going to be more in line with the word of God. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's, most, mostly we should pray. Um, we should pray. I, I've seen that God honors prayers and, and he um, makes effect for, but I don't think that anyone, whoever it is that gets into office, is going to save our country. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not the kind that's just doom and gloom. My hope is in the future. My hope is in what happens after the rapture. That's where my hope is. I'm not doom and gloom. Woohoo! I'm looking forward to what's coming. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, but. We're at such a stage that we should be able to believe everything that Scripture says. And Scripture doesn't paint a good picture of what's happening in the last days. And as we read more and more about the last days, we could say we're living in it. Everything we read about the last days, we're living it right now before our very eyes. Jesus is the answer, and he is coming to fix everything very soon. Uh, sometimes we think, well, how soon is very soon? Um, it, I don't know, but I know seven years isn't very long. And uh, after that seven years, the millennium is going to be an awesome time. He's going to be on the throne. So let's keep him on the throne right now and worship him every day. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this plan that we can read and we can know is true and it's going to happen exactly the way you planned it. And so, Lord, may we see through your eyes the people that are around us, sometimes we write them off because they don't believe the same things we believe. They don't care about the same things we care about. Lord, may we not write them off, but may we share the good news with them. Not about the upcoming rapture and, and tribulate. The good news is Jesus Christ and the fact that he died for all mankind, that he wants to save everyone. And so, Lord, help us to recognize that and to see the people that you are already working in their lives, that your Holy Spirit is already stirring their hearts. Lord, may we be able to go and water and plant that one day there may be a harvest. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together today to hear from you. We pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. 